welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering ghost tours and paranormal adventures in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director, and we really appreciate you joining us for today's episode. In the early morning hours of April 15th, 1912, the unsinkable Titanic went down in the North Atlantic. The tragic story of the notorious ocean liner and its 2,200 passengers, 1,500 of whom perished in the icy waters, continues to fascinate, terrify, and inspire the imagination. As we approach the anniversary of this historic event, we look at the Titanic from another angle, a supernatural one. Is it possible that some people knew in advance that the great ship's maiden voyage would end in disaster at sea? Our guest, retired professor Terry Keith, has recently compiled over 200 different cases many from difficult to obtain or out-of-print sources in his new book, Premonitions of the Titanic Disaster. He will be sharing with us some of the most intriguing and eerie examples, which of course only adds another layer of mystery to the story of the Titanic. But before we get to that, At this point, we have no further updates about our in-person experiences in Kingston, Ottawa, or Toronto. But our virtual haunted campfires do continue every Saturday night at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. This Saturday night, we will be learning all about ghost stories from New Mexico and the American Southwest. These campfires have been a lot of fun, and if you enjoy the podcast, you would certainly enjoy these as well. And if the timing doesn't work for you, we do continue to sell the recordings of the events. So if you want to go into the back catalog, you can find them all on our website at hauntedwalk.com. Also there, you can find information about our haunting at home, our at-home virtual paranormal experience. We've had close to 1,000 groups now complete the experiment, and we are compiling that data. And we would like as many Haunted Talks listeners as possible to participate. So to take advantage of the 40% off sale, which will be ending soon, you will want to check that out. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to us. Certainly, five-star reviews are always more than welcome. And we'd love to connect with you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all three of those at Haunted Walk. Well, hello. Uh, my name's Terry Keith, uh, Professor Terry Keith, emeritus professor. I spent my career as a professor, as, as a teacher and researcher in French, French literature, French philosophy. Um, I took very early retirement and then did a variety of different things, including lecturing quite extensively on mysteries and Because I was sometimes lecturing on cruise liners, I started becoming interested in sea mysteries and from there eventually focused on Titanic and from that eventually the the book came. So I've been retired for quite a long time but working quite hard and enjoying immersing myself in Titanic recently. The story of the Titanic continues to be a source of extreme interest here in Canada, and I suspect around the world as well. What was it that drew you to the story, and in particular to approach it from this angle of premonitions? I myself came on to premonitions because I was talking about mysteries, mysteries of Titanic, and I think premonitions 
since about 1960 have been one of the constant subjects relating to Titanic and one of the most mysterious. So I came to see that uh, nothing had been written specifically about premonitions for 30 years or so and eventually got round to writing a book that deals essentially with five major commentators who've written significantly on premonitions. That's between 1960 and 2006. The commentators are Ian Stevenson, who was a paranormal believer, a professor for many, many years. He started the ball rolling in 1960 with two articles setting out a number of examples. Then there was an, a Californian journalist called Rusty Brown who wrote a book in, I think, 86 or 82 or 86, concentrating on the, the strange aspects of Titanic and particularly premonitions. Uh, then a skeptic, a major skeptic, American skeptic, Martin Gardner, who wrote a very great deal uh, about mathematics. And he wrote a book in the 80s exposing the weakness in Stevenson's case. Then George Bayer, one of the most uh, respected commentators on Titanic, wrote a book. And finally, in 2006, a, a Frenchman, Bertrand Meur, uh, who's, again, someone who's very involved in the paranormal, wrote a book, and that's not translated. In fact, all of the five publications that I deal with in my book um, are very hard to get hold of now, and the French one by Meur has not been translated, so... Uh, that was really the uh, that was the rationale behind my writing the the book. There are various dimensions to the Canada connection. Of course, it's where the ship sank, which was 350 miles plus southeast of Newfoundland. There'd been extensive con radio contact with Cape Ra Cape Race on Newfoundland between Titanic and Cape Race. Um, then when the ship went down, the search for bodies was initiated from Halifax. Three or four, even four ships were sent to collect bodies. And on Titanic itself, there were 41 Canadians, 23 of whom died in the disaster, and many more passengers, perhaps as many as 100, were actually on their way to Canada, so had some kind of distant connection with Canada. One of the well-known cases is that of the Allison family. There were four members, the, uh, the mother and father and two children, and only the 11-month-old son survived. They're a very rich family, and they were on their way back after a holiday with four new servants that they'd hired in Scotland. And um, the story of how the one boy survived is quite complicated, but it's bound up with one of the servants, a woman called Alice Cleaver, who um, was mistaken in a number of books for a child murderer who was also called Alice Cleaver, but was in jail at the time. Um, so the Allison family story is in itself quite interesting. Then there were other well-known Canadians, Henry Molson, Brewing Empire, a man called George Wright, who was a millionaire from Halifax, and Mr. and Mrs. Dix were one of the 13 honeymoon couples. And these Canadians on the ship knew each other and mixed quite a lot. One of the um, the most famous of all is Charles Melville Hayes is a town, in a city in Saskatchewan, it's named after him. He was actually going, anxious to get back to Canada, to open the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa. <laughs> and I think this is one of the places that you, uh, that you visit on your walks, isn't it? He's, uh, some say his ghost still haunts the Chateau Laurier. <laughs>
which is in itself quite interesting. He was a great railway man, a great magnate with uh, the, the Grand Trunk Pacific Railway and so on. He actually was also the initiator of one of the minor premonitions that I cover in the book, because just before, a few hours before Titanic struck the iceberg, it said that he announced that the time would soon come for, quote, the greatest and most appalling of all disasters at sea. And that's taken by some to be a, a premonition. But after the collision itself, he said, you can't sink this boat. And later on, he thought it was good for uh, for eight hours or so. They were the, the main Canadians. There was one more family that's very important. The Fortune family, again, a very rich family. Six members of the family and only the husband and the 19-year-old son survived. They'd made a fortune in Manitoba real estate. And the premonition angle with them comes in from the fact that one of the daughters, Alice Fortune, had her palm read in Cairo. They'd visited Egypt uh, as part of their tour. She had her palm read in Cairo by an Indian fortune teller who said the following, you are in danger every time you travel on the sea, for I see you adrift on the ocean in an open boat. You will lose everything but your life. You will be saved, but others will be lost. That seems a pretty clear uh, prediction. And some think that it was fulfilled. Others dwell on the discrepancies between the actual prediction and the, and the outcome. George Bayer, who's one of the commentators that I, that I discuss in the book, says that it was accurate, but because Alice's mother and Alice's two sisters were saved, she can't be described as having lost everything. You are correct, and I'm so glad you brought up Charles Melville Hayes, as we do tell his story every night on our original Haunted Walk of Ottawa, When We Can Run, and The Hauntings, at the Chateau Laurier. And we also do share his premonition, which is quite eerie. In fact, we did our own historical research about the Titanic and Charles Melville Hayes, as there's been a prominent local urban legend here in Ottawa that furniture destined for the opening of the Chateau Laurier went down with Hayes aboard the Titanic. And if listeners are interested in hearing more about that, that was covered in episode 70 of Haunted Talks. We did find it difficult sifting through the various historical accounts, though in the end we rendered a verdict that this urban legend is more than likely totally myth and has to do more with connecting a local building to the Titanic and its story, which carries so much historical weight and gravity. But in some ways, I think that's very similar to what you have done in your book, where you're looking at these premonitions through the eyes of several different investigators or, or commenters upon them. Now, in the book, you lay out there are kind of three different premonitions or categories of premonitions. Could you tell us about those categories and maybe share an example from the first? So there are three categories of, of premonition uh, in the book, the, the literary ones, and I'll come on to that now. Then there are the premonitions concerning the death of W.T. Stead, who was a prominent uh, political figure, social reformer, spiritualist, and many, many premonitions of his death. I did, that's the second category. And the third category is the general, general premonitions, which can be divided up in, under various headings. As far as the literary premonitions, the alleged literary premonitions are concerned, the major one is one by an American writer of sea stories called Morgan Robertson. And the first time people hear this, they're, they're, they're quite taken aback because the parallels between Robertson's story, which was written, which was published 14 years before Titanic went down, the parallels between his story and the Titanic disaster can be seen as, as, as quite remarkable. Stevenson, who's the first commentator I deal with, 
lists the name of the ship, which in Robertson's story was Titan, believe it or not. The myth of unsinkability, because they, his story begins with an account of how the Titan is supposed to be unsinkable. Collision with an iceberg, sinking in the month of April at midnight. The technicalities, displacement, tonnage, length of ship, speed of ship at impact number of propellers, number of lifeboats, and the enormous loss of life. And when you put that together, it looks a very impressive premonition of, uh, of the Titanic disaster. But the way in which um, all five commentators deal with it, I think, is to say that he was very interested in the development of ships, and he is extrapolating from the size of ships in his time to what they would be likely to be in the future. Um, and that, that explains a number of the technical similarities. The fact that there weren't enough lifeboats uh, was a well-known fact at the time. And the, there's enormous loss of life in both cases, but far more uh, lose their life in Robertson's story. As I say, if you take it item by item, it is possible to say, well, although that looks like a, a clear case of a premonition, it's probably derivable by pure inference from the state of shipbuilding at the time. And there is also the question of whether Roberts, what Robertson himself claimed, and he didn't specifically claim that his story was a premonition. There is controversy about the extent to which he was himself a medium or a psychic. Um, so bit by bit, one can unravel the, the similarities. But as I say, that it can be it can be constructed in such a way as to seem a rather remarkable foresight 14 years before the event. That's the main literary example. And then there's a story that was published almost at, at the very moment when Titanic set out. Uh, that's a story by a man whose pen name was Main Clue Garnett. And again, it has quite close parallels of various kinds with Titanic. So there's, there's a small array of, example, of literary examples. I think work needs to be done on them because the influence of one on the other hasn't really been investigated and I think that's probably a factor that, that's worth bearing in mind. I really enjoy the Robertson example in part because it's so eerie and it does match up so well with what occurred in the North Atlantic that, that fateful night. But how do we make sense of the fact that this is a fictional work where the author does not in any way indicate this is a premonition? In some ways it's almost a a, a premonition in retrospect. So how do we differentiate between coincidence and a premonition? That's a very good question. It's a question that I raised myself in one of the last chapters in the book when I'm looking at the methods and results of the five commentators. Does something have to be claimed by the recipient as a, as a premonition. Uh, I don't think it actually does. I think there are circumstances that one can imagine where someone has what other people regard as a premonition, either at the time or after. But I think it's a very interesting question, and it's one, again, that probably needs a lot more examination than it's received so far. Perhaps this is a little bit of a cheeky question, but did you have any premonitions to write the book in advance of actually starting it. No, no, not at all. No, I, I, I'm generally skeptical. I, I don't set out to to debunk these cases, but I approach the subject with a kind of general skepticism. No, I, I'm not aware that I've had any significant premonitions myself, I must admit. <laughs> if I know our audience at this point, they are probably quite desperate to hear more of these examples of potential premonitions that occurred around the sinking of the ship. Could you share with us some of your eerie favorites? They're all anecdotal cases. I, I should say that I, I don't deal at all with the 
experimental evidence or premonitions. That's a totally separate matter. There's one ghost story. I deal with 201 cases altogether. It's the first book to have dealt with all of the cases considered by these uh, these commentators. 201 altogether. Just one, I think, is uh, is a ghost story. It's a woman in Portsmouth in, in England who was on the beach watching Titanic go by and, quote, a woman in a golden brown dress with a matching hat and parasol suddenly appeared to her left and then to her right. And this woman apparently told Reverend Estelle Barnes, as she calls herself, to call the police and the White Star Line and to tell them to order the Titanic to return to port. Tragedy would overtake the ship in just a few days' time. And when she looked back towards this woman, there was no one there. And the, it's just the fact that Barnes herself was a spiritualist and the fact that the only source of the incident is a letter by Barnes herself, <laughs> dated from 1973. It's that that weakens the case, but that's, that's a, the only ghost story. There are many pre, alleged premonitory dreams in the 201 cases. A woman in New York who, who woke her husband because she'd had a vivid dream that her mother was in a, in a crowded lifeboat rocking on in the ocean. She didn't know her mother was on Titanic. Her mother was on Titanic coming to America to surprise her. That's one case. Another remarkable case is that of Marcel Navratil. She was the wife of, of Michel. He had, without her knowing, kidnapped their two young sons. And he was on Titanic with them. And she had a, is alleged to have had a vivid dream on the night of the 14th of April when Titanic sank, that her husband silent, came into her bedroom and silently handed her a letter sealed in a blackboarded envelope. And she didn't know that the husband and sons were on Titanic. She only discovered this when she read stories of two young boys in New York and realized that they were her sons, and she eventually went to New York and was reunited with them. Mayer, the, the French commentator, rates it as one of his favorite eight, or favored eight premonitions, thinks it's one of the most remarkable in the, in the dossier. But again, his sources are a little bit dubious. Just one more dream, there's a woman in called Ida Lorenz in the depths of Brazil on the night of the Titanic sinking. She had a dream and asked her husband to note down the exact time, said she'd seen a great ship that had hit an iceberg, <laughs> and so on. There are prophecies by psychics as well. These figure quite prominently in the corpus, men or women who either had their palms read or went to see a psychic and premonitions were, were had of their fate. A fortune teller, gypsy fortune teller, read the palm of an officer from a steamship saying, on the sea lies your work and next year the greatest ship in the world will sink. The officer, in fact, had no real connection with Titanic, but um, it's true that the... Uh, the greatest ship in the world sank the following year. But again, one of the commentators points out that uh, we don't know whether the man concerned was in uniform, which which would have made the, uh, the story a little bit less extraordinary. Then there are visions of disaster. There's one very striking case of a, a dying girl called Jessie who asked for the presence of uh, a Scottish Salvation Army captain. And on the evening of the 14th of April, she said, hold my hand, captain, I'm so afraid. Can't you see that big ship sinking in the water? Look at all those people who are drowning. Someone called Wally is playing a fiddle and coming to you. Now, the interesting thing about the, the end of that is that Wallace was the main player of the orchestra, Wallace Hartley, of course. Uh, he was a friend of the Salvation Army captain, 
and who didn't know apparently that he was on Titanic. That's a very striking story, and there are many others. This is George Bayer, who gives the Vancouver Daily Province, as a matter of fact, as his source. He records that in Suva, which was the capital of Fiji, on the 16th of April, the officers of a liner called Marama were told by the inhabitants that Titanic had gone down with heavy loss of life. Not only did they not know that, but it's said that the news of Titanic hadn't reached the Pacific at that time. And they couldn't explain how Fiji knew. Um, and Mayer says that this is one of the strangest cases in the, in the dossier. And he says that it makes him wonder whether it's a question of a means of communication characteristic of ancient peoples. He points out that the accounts of missionaries, there are stories of, of, of this kind quite commonly in, in, in missionaries' accounts. But it, it's a vague story. What was the exact date of the incident? How long was Marama in Suva? And so on. Those are some outstanding examples, and uh, there are many, many more. And they, they all have a two sides, really. A, a positive side that can be put positively and a negative side, I think. As someone interested in premonitions about the Titanic, what challenges did you run into from a historical research perspective? Because I imagine many of these accounts and many of these stories, it may be hard to find the original sources or they might have been more widely spread by word of mouth. My own terms of reference were quite narrow. I mean, I, I just consider these 201 cases that the commentators deal with. But I do say in the book at the end that even to investigate these 201 cases, many of which are trivial and not worth further investigation, but to investigate just this set of cases would require a team of researchers, really, because you'd have to follow up all the sources and then again assess how reliable those sources are. It's really a very complex business recreating what happened over a 100 years ago. Uh, we lose the information quite quickly. So it, it really is very challenging. And I, what I would like to see, I would like to see a, a team of researchers looking at the whole matter thoroughly, much more thoroughly than I've been able to, following up sources and so on. And there are teams of researchers who work on Titanic and have done very good work indeed. There's one book called On a Sea of Glass, which is particularly good putting together information from all sorts of sources. I'd like to see a team investigating premonitions much more thoroughly than I've been able to. From the stories you've shared, it does appear that these premonitions may have been taking place all over the world at quite significant distances from where the sinking actually took place. In your research, did you note any difference between geographical areas and premonitions? For example, were they more likely in the UK, Canada, the US, where there may be stronger connections to the ship itself or the people that were on board? Um, I haven't. I haven't really looked into that. I I couldn't give a, a, a definitive answer to that. But certainly, many from America. And um, if you look, for instance, at George Bear's book, he heavily uses newspapers, but they're mostly American and Canadian newspapers that he uses. Uh, but the, the no geographical boundaries. I mean, I mentioned the the case in Brazil. The, Marcel Navratil in France and so on, um, like the passengers on Titanic um, who came from a whole variety of countries, some unexpected from the Middle East and so on. I think these stories come from, from all over. If we take these premonitions at face value, I think we make the assumption that because the incident was so tragic that it created the space or the environment or the psychic energy where foreknowledge of the event may have actually occurred. That makes me curious if you've looked at any other 
similar tragic historic events. And if you've seen the same number of premonitions as you've kind of collected here about the Titanic. Again, it's a very good question. No, I haven't myself uh, researched other cases, but I do raise this matter again towards the end of the the book. Let me say first of all that early in the uh, early in the twentieth century, um, there was a very great vogue for spiritualist phenomena of one kind or another. Uh, when Titanic sank, it was at the heart of this uh, crazy vogue for uh, for spiritualist stories of one kind or another. The two examples that are often cited are 9-11. It's said that there were quite a few premonitions of 9-11. And the Aberfan disaster in Wales in, I think, 1966, a great landslide killed a lot of children in a school. Um, and again, there are a lot of examples of premonitions of, of that. So I think with with many, many catastrophes, you could root around and come up with uh, a great many uh, alleged premonitions. But again, Gardner, who's the skeptic, points out that we all have kind of premonitions all the time. And because they don't come right, as it were, we forget them very quickly. And he mentions the situation of San Francisco and says if, if there is a, a big, serious earthquake in San Francisco, then a number of people will immediately come forward and say they had a premonition of it because it's, it's, it's a question of scale, it's a question of numbers. A great many people will be dreaming of of a disaster in San Francisco on any on any one night. I think but it's a very interesting question. I think one of the most alluring things about premonitions, I think, is the idea that if someone had foreknowledge, history could have been changed. In the Titanic premonitions, are there any people who had these experiences? who could have changed history? Was there anyone well-connected? Or were these more like average people who had these somewhat unique encounters? I can't think of a kind of outstanding instance where someone who may have had a premonition could have changed things. I mentioned the the case of Estelle Barnes in Portsmouth, uh, where the ghost told her to ring up White Star and tell the ship to come back. Uh, there was a similar case, another similar case to that, someone seeing the ship go by and saying it'll never reach New York and let's do something about it. But it's very difficult to know who might have done something about it. The, the whole mechanism uh, of, of getting Titanic across the Atlantic was, was a powerful one. And uh, I think it would have taken more than a a simple premonition by anyone to, to stop that happening. I'd be curious, Terry, given the amount of time you spent working on the book and the subject matter, has it all impacted your view of premonitions or your belief in premonitions or even the paranormal? Not really, Jim. Uh, as I say, I, I came in generally sceptical, and I, I remain that way. What strikes me about the five commentators is how little agreement there is among them on particular cases. There are confusions, there are different details given, uh, sometimes contradictions and so on. And I would have expected or one might expect, I think, that with five commentators, at least a few cases would be common to them all in the sense that they find them all uh, particularly significant. This isn't the case, and uh, it's the general confusion, I think, and the lack of agreement among these commentators that, that struck me. Um, and I think only if there had been some common ground, some common belief in uh, in some cases at least, would I have been inclined to change my mind? Uh, but I haven't found anything myself in these 
cases that, uh, that, that convinces me. I have to say that. A big thank you to Terry Keefe for joining us and sharing a little bit about his book, Premonitions of the Titanic Disaster. And that is available on Amazon and a wide variety of booksellers. And of course, thank you for joining us. Be sure to subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to us. And we'd love to connect with you on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, all three at Haunted Walk. Be sure to visit hauntedwalk.com for tickets to our upcoming virtual haunted campfires or any of the previously recorded ones. And there as well, you will find information about our Haunting at Home, our online guided audio experience. As always, a special thanks to our Haunted Talks team, including Michelle Dennis, our outstanding audio editor, and Kevin McLeod at incompetech.filmmusic.io for the additional music. Until we meet again, sweet dreams. Sweet dreams.